As we discussed in the previous service, the idea of leadership, looking at a portrait of leadership, I want us to consider an example of leadership and try to make some application of that to our lives today. When you think about leadership, leadership carries with it an awesome responsibility. We take it for granted sometimes. We live in a society that has fueled the idea of belittling and say whatever you want to about those in power, the freedom of speech. But just because we have the freedom to say something doesn't necessarily mean we should. And there are times where we go too far with that. And we sometimes even unconsciously deter some young person from wanting ever to become a leader because of what they heard said. I was talking with a preacher who was directing a school of preaching on one occasion. He stepped down from that. He was having a very hard time getting young men to come to the school to want to be preachers. He said, I'm having a hard time finding parents who want their children to be preachers. What a sad thing that is. What about elders? What about leadership? As we see that lack of good leadership has brought about the fall of of many governments, great governments. It's brought about the fall of individuals, even some congregations of the Lord's church. I was talking recently with a, an elder, a preacher, an educator. He was talking, of, we were talking about congregations who literally closed the doors, sold the buildings. He said, I blame leadership. I believe there's some truth to that. Why is that? Because if we're honest about this, and this is true, People, sad but true, seldom rise above their leadership. I, I, that's it, not always is true. I understand that there are some individuals who, who are determined they're going to do that. But just as a sheer reality, sad but true, people seldom rise above their leadership. And if you want to ask about leadership in the Bible, and if I were to say and poll the congregation, give me your top ten leaders in the Bible. The one we're going to talk about today would be in the top three, if not the top five. David. He stands out, doesn't he? I mean, there's so many things about David with which we can't relate, but then there are also so many things that we can relate to this great man, this great leader. And I want us to look at three different points as we study the life of this man and going over some events in his life that are very familiar to us. Uh, don't want them to be trite, but some things that we do need to discuss and look at when we think about this great leader, David. And I want us to consider how he's showing us, he's leading us even today, and how to be a great leader in the face of opposition, how to be a great leader in the face of failure, and how to be a great leader in the face of the next generation. And that's important. And then we can make some application. Each one of these points is going to have four sub points to it. And I didn't put a whole lot of blanks on the page to let you write what you'd like on your outline or you get another piece of paper if you need more room there. But I want us to consider first and foremost how to be a great leader in the face of opposition. You can't talk about David without 1 Samuel 17. What an awesome event that took place in history with David facing the giant Goliath. As you open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see that the Philistines, verse 1, have gathered their, together their armies to battle. They gathered there in Shokoth, and they, which belongeth to Judah. And so they pitched between these lands of Shokoth and uh, Azekiah and the and Ephesidim. If you're going to say that. So here's the land where they're fighting. They're getting ready for this great battle. And I want you to envision in your mind. I want you to see a great army on each side. And it was. The Israelites had a large army. And then the Philistines had a large army. But you know the scene, and you've heard this from your youth, that of the Philistines, there was this man of Gath, a giant of a man, nine and a half feet tall. His name was Goliath. And he has this idea. He comes out and he says, you send a champion to fight me, and it'll just be a one-on-one -on -one battle. Winner takes all. Now, before we go any further with that, I want you to put yourself there. I want you to see war is terrible. The thought of 
of sending our young men and women into harm's way is a terrible thought. Today, though, and not, not belittling and not making light of it in any way, form, or fashion, but it is a reality that today we can have someone stationed here in the United States pushing a button on a console and sending a missile on the other side of the world to take out an enemy target. That wasn't this battle. This would be a battle where you had to get within arm's length with a sword or a shield or a spear to fight your battle. You see the whites of their eyes. You look up close and personal at this battle. So before we get too rough on King Saul, before we get too rough, who was head and shoulders above all the rest of the Israelites, mind you, he was a specimen of a man, no doubt. Before we get too rough even on Eliab later on, what would you do? If he's calling out a nine and a half foot tall man, monster of a man, well-trained man. I see some large men today and, and sometimes they're so large they're a little awkward. That wasn't this man. You don't carry a shield, a spear, and a sword the size and the weight of the shield, spear, and sword that this man did and be awkward. He was a warrior. Now if I were being 6'1 and I'm 6'1", stand next to, a, say, a Shaquille O'Neal at seven feet tall, I would look small. I, I would like to look small, <laughs> but I would look small. Nine and a half feet tall would make Shaquille O'Neal look small. Just two, just a couple of feet. What's the, it makes a huge difference. And this is the man that he's going to have to face, the opposition and so, first sub point I want you to consider how to be a great leader in facing opposition is you need to be where you're supposed to be. Now, what is that? How does that apply to this situation? If you look back to verses 17 and following, there in chapter 17, it says, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. So, number one, David was where he needed to be. David was obeying his father as he goes to take this to his brethren brethren and to the captains over his brethren but it put him where he needed to be verse 23 for this moment verse 23 says and as he talked with them behold there came up the champion of the Philistines of Gath Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words the same words that he had spoken earlier send one man to fight he, he didn't say that one time. He didn't just come out once and say, okay, here I am, ready to fight. You send one man, we'll fight, winner take all. And he went and sat down and waited. He kept saying this. Where's your champion? Where's your mighty man? Here I am, I'm waiting. Are you scared? I can imagine some of the things he would say. Over and over again, he repeated himself. But listen to the last three words of verse 23, and David heard them. David heard what Goliath was saying. Why? Because he was where he needed to be. Of all the people on the planet, David needed to hear those words. Everybody else heard them. All the other Israelites heard. King Saul heard. His brother Eliab heard. All of them heard, but David was the one who needed to hear. Because David was the only one with enough faith to do something about it. He couldn't contain. He couldn't hold himself. But it says in verse 24, And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were sore afraid. I have to be honest, I most likely would too. I have said and talking, there's, there's some people who love to run and they, they just get a, a thrill out of that and does their body good exercise, you know, bodily exercise profits little. I don't run unless I'm being chased. This is a man who would make me run. Goliath is a man who would make me run. You know what's interesting though? I don't think I would have been afraid of a David, which would really and truly have been a lot scarier than we take things for granted, don't we? David didn't because he was where he needed to be. Number two, don't listen to wicked and fearful counsel. 
how to be a leader in the face of opposition. You be where you're supposed to be. But don't listen to wicked and fearful counsel. Go down to verse 15. Well, verses 4 through 15, rather, is, is again Goliath's words. We can understand that's wicked counsel. It's the idea of, of it seems logical on face value if you're a Philistine and if you're Goliath, it seems logical, but he's defying the armies of God. David would make that statement. He's defying Jehovah God in his statements. Therefore, it's wicked counsel. But the one that I want you to consider is as we continue looking at verse 28. It says, and Eliab, this is, this is, of course, David has said in verse 26, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? How, how are you people just standing here letting this happen? How are you letting him talk this way about God's army, God's people? And this is what Eliab, his eldest brother, heard. And when he spake these to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. Thou art come down to thou not to see the battle. You just want to see a little action. Now, the text says that his anger was kindled against David, but I have to be wondering if it's really more so that he's angry with himself. You think so? When you, what do you know about Eliab? He was David's brother. He was the eldest son of Jesse. That's, that's good. What else do you know about Eliab? When Samuel is going to anoint the next king, Saul has gotten too big for his britches, right? His pride has led him away and he's going to give a kingdom to someone better. He goes to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel. The first one he sees, Eliab. And what does Samuel say? Surely the Lord's anointing is here. There was something about Eliab that made Samuel say, that's him. Now remember, this is the man who anointed King Saul. And I emphasized already that Saul was head and shoulders above the rest of the Israelites, so I suspect he looked the part. This man looks the part, but he was too afraid to go against Goliath. And here's little brother. Little brother comes to bring us some cheese and some food. And he's out here spouting off in front of all of my fellow soldiers who are also are shaking, saying, is there not a cause? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Eliab, what's wrong with you? How dare you? But it was fearful counsel. Eliab was afraid. I'm not going to stand against this giant. I can't win this battle. He couldn't see beyond the physical. Now what helped David with that? Always being where he was supposed to be? Not always, but being where he was supposed to be helped him along the way. Where he was supposed to be with God helped him along the way. Like earlier on in his life, he would face a bear. You know, nine and a half feet tall is huge, isn't it? Some bears get up to 20 feet. And there's something about a man that might be a little bit easier than that of a bear. A bear has no inhibition. Your food. You're in the way of my food. There's a chance that even a Goliath might feel a little pity for the boy. He is a human, after all. But nevertheless, he stood against a lion as well. And he even says he grabbed him by the beard. It reminds me of an old country song, I've got a tiger by the tail. <laughs> That would be the end that I would want if I hadn't hold one, you know, by the way. But still, he grabbed him by the beard and slew him, but he gave God the credit. He gave God the credit. Why? Because the third thing I want us to consider is be where you're supposed to be. Of course, don't listen to wicked and fearful counsel, but trust in the true deliverer. The true deliverer. Verse 45. Verses 40. That's the start with verse 44. The Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. So Goliath has said to David, Now, don't, don't, don't want you to think for a moment that David was this little young, young boy. Sometimes the picture's a little, dis that's not exactly the case. He was young, yes. A lot younger than you would expect to be going out into the battle, but not young, young, young. 
it's a good chance he could have been at least six foot. You know, that's that's a good chance. But nevertheless, what had Goliath said to him? I'm going to kill you. That's what he said. And it wasn't just idle words. It's, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to leave your carcass out here for the birds to eat and the beasts of the field. That's serious. That's very serious. But David trusted in the true deliverer. Look at verse 45 now. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me, note it, with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But, contrast that. You come to me with what? You come to me with physical weapons of war. But I come to you with what? I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. You think you're serious with your big spear. You think you're serious with your big sword, with your big shield, and with your height. You have defied the God of creation. You've already lost. That was David. That, brothers and sisters, is faith. That, brothers and sisters, is leadership. He says this day, verse 46, this day, because I'm a mighty warrior and I can, I can hit a fly at a thousand paces with my sling, he didn't say any of that, did he? He said, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Note it, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Not that all the earth will know how mighty a man of valor I am, but that all the earth will know that there's a God in Israel. He's going to deliver you. I trust him. I put my confidence in God. So be where you're supposed to be. Don't listen to wicked and fearful counsel. Trust in the true deliverer. And then finally, get to work. Get to work. Look at verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hasted and ran toward. Toward. He hasted. He hurried up. He ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Again, not a lot makes me run. But it would have to be a whole lot of faith to make me run toward that. And that's exactly what David is teaching me. How to be that kind of leader. It's not always easy, is it? But David had confidence. That's part of the faith that we talk about, biblically speaking. It's a trust. It's a confidence that no matter what, it's going to be okay. That doesn't mean we're to be reckless. David wasn't reckless. David took five stones, didn't he? He only used one, but he took five. He wasn't reckless. If you go back and you continue looking at this getting to work, he ran toward, he hasted, he ran toward, verse 49, he took, he smote, verse 50, he prevailed, verse 51, he ran and stood upon the Philistine, he took the Philistine's sword, cut his head off, they fled. True leaders. True leaders will always turn to flight the enemies of God because they're going to be where they're supposed to be. They're not going to listen to wicked and fearful counsel. They're going to trust in the true deliverer and they're going to get to work. But number two, Roman numeral number two, how to be a great leader in the face of failure. You know as well as I do that David had that lapse in judgment. That scene we read about in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12 with Bathsheba. These same points that we use, sub points, apply here as well. I want us to consider the 51st Psalm, though, in light of this scene. And I want us to consider, first of all, we need to be where we're supposed to be. David 
starts out with a negative on this one, not being where he was supposed to be. Put your ribbon at Psalm 51, but there in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel, rather chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Note this, at the time when what? When kings go forth to battle, that David sent. Kings go forth, David sent. He sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But, contrast that, David tarried still at Jerusalem. What if David had been where he was supposed to be here? Well, he certainly wouldn't have been on his rooftop, and he certainly wouldn't have seen Bathsheba bathing. He certainly wouldn't have lusted over her, took her to himself, conceived a child, committed cover up by murdering her husband and having to have in chapter 12 Nathan come to him with that story of the little ewe lamb we need to be where we're supposed to be and so how is David where he's supposed to be on the high side of this failure go to Psalm 51 Psalm 51 look with me at verses 3 through 6 David says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. I acknowledge my sin. David was where he needed to be now in the presence of God, realizing his ownership of his failure. He said it to Nathan as well, 2 Samuel 12 and verse 13. I have sinned. This is my sin. I have fallen short. I have committed this trespass. Against thee, thee only, we know and we've made this statement many times, David sinned against his own flesh because fornication is not just a good thing, a cool thing for teenagers to do to come to themselves. It is a sin against your own flesh, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's wickedness. God reserved that relationship for one place and one place only, the marriage relationship. And anything less than that is cheap, dirty, and vile. But David said against thee, the only of us. Did he not know he sinned against his own flesh? Yes, he did. David sinned against Bathsheba. Absolutely, he violated her. Absolutely. And I'm not talking about, I, I'm not going into this and there's, there's a lot of people want to speculate. I don't see a rape situation in this and you can def defy that if you want to. I don't care. I don't see that. She loved him later on and married him. I don't see that happening a lot with rape. But nevertheless, he defiled her in the sense that he took something that didn't belong to him. He should have turned around and went back downstairs. Moving on. He sinned against Uriah the Hittite. Absolutely. Of all the people he sinned against, Uriah, he took his wife. He had him murdered. Uriah was one of his mighty men of valor. A faithful warrior in his tribe. He sinned against him. David sinned against the whole of Israel. He's God's anointed. But he understood that my sin puts me at odds with God first and foremost. Every sin is against him first and foremost. And that's where he needed to be. Against thee, the only. Have I done this? He didn't listen to the wicked and fearful counsel any longer. You go back and you think about chapter 12 of 2 Samuel verses 1 through 17 and Nathan has to tell him this story. This is good counsel. There was this man who had a ewe lamb. You remember the account. He loved it, fed it from his own table, treated it like a child. His master had many flocks. He took, though, that ewe lamb and fed it to a guest. David said, the man should die. You're the man. You're the man. Brothers and sisters, we need Nathans in our lives who are willing to come to us and say, you're the man. You've done wrong. David was content to listen to the the counsel that he had going on in his own head of trying to cover up the sin he thought he had won that battle until Nathan comes along and says you're the man 
David condemned himself, didn't he? In that story, you remember David wrote most of the Psalms and most likely that first Psalm that we mentioned many times, blessed is man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of the sinner nor sits in the seat of the scornful. David understood that more fully here than he did before. He understood fully the counsel of the ungodly, the way of the sinner, the scornful more completely and he wanted to be that blessed man who doesn't do those things. So he listened to not the fearful, not the wicked counsel, but the good counsel. He puts his trust now in the true deliverer. Go back to the 51st Psalm. 50, Psalm 51 verse 1 says, Have mercy, God's part. Blot out, verse 1, God's part. Wash me, God's part. Cleanse me, God's part, verse 2. Verse 3 is his part. I acknowledge my sin, as we already noted, against thee, verse 4, his part. Go down to verse 7. He says, purge me, God's part. Wash me again, God's part. Make me, God's part. Verse 8, to hear the joy of gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. That's God's part. He's pleading with you. I'm trusting that you can do this, God. I'm going to have a hard time forgetting. David had a hard time forgetting. Every time he thought about that child, that he lost. Every time he, he looked at a soldier, no doubt he would see Uriah. But he wanted God to hide his face from his iniquities, to create in him a clean heart and renew a right spirit within him, to cast him not away from his presence and take not the Holy Spirit from me. He would say, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me God's heart. He's putting his trust in God. That's how to be a great leader in the face of failure. You have to acknowledge, yes. He's not just going to create a clean heart in you without your repentance. It's until David said, I have sinned, he was going to continue to be the murdering adulterer. He owned it and he turned it over to the Lord. But then, as we were saying in our points, you have to get to work. Where's the getting to work in Psalm 51? Look at verse 13. Then, after you've done these things, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted. Go on down and look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. But if you do this for me, verse 15, he says, I'll show forth. I will sing aloud. My lips will sing aloud your praises. I'm going to get to work. Because I see what God has given me. Turned me from this adulterous murderer into a man after his own heart. God can do that for David. David says God can do that for you and for me. Then finally, look with me at 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and see how David is leading us and showing us how to be a great leader in the face, or facing rather, the next generation. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, look at verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. There's a lot of ifs in that, isn't there? How do these four subpoints apply here? Be where you're supposed to be. Where are we supposed to be? In service to him. Notice again, he says, Know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect or complete heart. A complete focused mindset on him. He is first and foremost. You know him as your God. Not just the God of your father. You know him as your God. 
See, David, the father, is handing this down to Solomon, his son, and saying, this is how you're going to be a faithful leader. This is how you're going to be a great leader. This is how you're going to be faithful to God. You serve him. Be where you're supposed to be. Don't listen to wicked and fearful counsel. Why? Because the Lord searches the hearts and understands all the imaginations. You can't get one over on him. We as children sometimes try to pull the wool over our parents' eyes. And you've heard the old saying about moms having eyes in the back of their heads. And, and there's, there seems to be some truth to that many times, but God actually does see and know everything. So don't listen to wicked counsel, fearful counsel. Wicked counsel says, hey, it doesn't matter. It'll be okay. You're just young and you're just sowing your wild oats and just... Join us and it'll be okay. You, you can repent later. That's wicked counsel. God knows. What about the fearful counsel? Afraid to make a stand for the truth? In the face of opposition? Or in the face of your own failures? Afraid to confess those to God? It's a dangerous place to be. Don't listen to wicked and fearful counsel. The Lord searches all hearts and understands it. Number three, place your trust in the true deliverer. What did he say? You seek him and he will be found of you. You seek him. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. You seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. He promised that, didn't he? Do we trust him? Are we seeking him? But then there's the get to work. That goes to verse 10. Get to work goes into verse 10. He says, Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Get to work. Solomon, and now you got you to think back to the history of this too and remind yourself, David wanted so badly to build the temple, didn't he? I want to build a house for my God. God says, you're not going to do that. You're a man of, you got blood on your hands. You're a man of war. So, okay, well, I can't build it. I've got the plans for it, and I'll gather the material, at least a lot of it. And you can almost see this proud father saying, Solomon, get to work, yes. But Solomon, look, you've got an awesome opportunity before you. I look and I see some young men, and I say, there's some awesome responsibilities. Yes, there's some awesome opportunities that are before you. Opportunities to be gospel preachers. Opportunities to be Bible class teachers. Opportunities to be elders in the Lord's church. But then I have to remind myself that God is asking me to be a leader in the face of that next generation. To help mold them, encourage them, motivate them. Step up to the plan. Get to work. Solomon was building a literal building, temple, house. We're building a spiritual house of God. The church, the body of Christ. So David is showing us what it means to be a genuine Great, genuinely great leader. Acts 13, 22 is where this statement is made that I have found in him a man after mine own heart. God speaking of the patriarch David. And then we think about how he's still leading us today by his example. I need to ask myself, how am I doing in the face of opposition? It's appointed unto men that we're going to suffer persecution as we're righteous, as we're faithful to Him. All that live godly shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12, we mentioned even this morning in the first service. How are we dealing with our failures? Paul teaches us how to do that a little bit. This is one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind. I reach forward, I press toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Putting those things behind us and moving forward. How well are we directing that next generation. 
2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul said, The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful brethren who will teach others also. You have an opportunity put before you. And with that opportunity becomes a responsibility because God's already given a lot of us a lot more ability than we're willing to admit. So let's all be where we're supposed to be. Avoid that wicked and fearful counsel and trust in the true deliverer and get to work. David is leading us today, but will we follow? The Lord is still calling today, but will we answer? Jesus is saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And David is saying that you can say just like he, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow David, right? All the days of his life and David will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you and me. And we all can live and dwell in the house of the Lord forever, but only if the Lord is your shepherd. And only if you're leading others to that same shepherd today. You've heard the word of God, believe it. Trust in him enough to repent of your sins and confess his name. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Walk that newness of life faithful unto death. And let's all be great leaders in the kingdom of God. If you need to respond, do so now as we stand. I have